Well, Paul, thank you for that exceedingly kind introduction. And let me just start by thanking uh, a few people very quickly. Let me thank uh, the Laurier Institution and uh, UBC for being such fantastic hosts. Uh, for Yahoo and for, for CBC Radio making this possible. Let me just also thank uh, Gordon here one more time. Uh, think of it this way, no matter how bad I am this evening, it was still worth it to come out to listen to him play for 15 minutes. So if we could just get another round of applause there, I would really appreciate that. So what you guys may not realize is that when lectures like this get booked, they get booked about a year in advance. And you get invited to give a talk like this, and you end up saying, well, I'm sure I'm going to say something about human rights and the internet. I hope that will be topical. <laughs> and this year, it's turned out to be very, very topical. We sort of caught a lucky break. Those of us who study social change as a whole, uh, 2011 is shaping up to be the sort of year that we're thinking about and talking about for perhaps decades to come. And when I say that we're going to be thinking about it and talking about it, I don't necessarily mean that we're going to be celebrating it. I hope we will be. I hope that the sorts of changes that have started coming about in 2011, starting in Tunisia, spreading through Egypt, spreading through the Arab world, uh, influencing movements like Occupy, I hope this is the beginning of the sort of change that we're ending up celebrating 5, 10, 20 years from now as a moment where the world became a very different place. But it's very, very hard to know. As we're talking this evening, we've just gone through a truly horrific day in Egypt. The last two days, a small group of people in Tahrir Square who were trying to occupy the square to call attention to the issue of military tribunals have been forced out of that space, and forced out of that space in a way that's incredibly brutal. Uh, it looks like uh, the count today involves at least 12 dead, uh, it may include up to a thousand seriously injured. Uh, and it really calls into question whether or not the events that inspired so many of us when we looked to Egypt earlier this year have actually turned into what some of us feared, which is basically a civilian-led military coup. Uh, and it's very difficult to know how this is all going to turn out. It's very difficult to know how a movement like Occupy uh, which has started small, has been growing, gaining momentum uh, with people around North America and around the world finding ways to express their dissent by physically occupying space. We don't know at this point whether that's going to fizzle and die. We don't know whether that's going to turn into political parties or whether it's going to directly turn into change. It's incredibly hard to know. Are we going to look back at 2011? Are we going to feel like it was another 1989, the fall of communism, 1968, student riot riots, protests over race, 1848? It, it sounds really glib to make the argument that somehow 2011 is going to turn out to be as important as the fall of communism. But let me say, I think it's going to be at least as complicated. As you watched the Berlin Wall fall, as you watched the former Soviet Union break apart, we had a general sense where the world might be going. There were a lot of people who ended up saying, hey, we'd really like to try representative democracy, a reasonably strong welfare state. Let's try that out as a model and see how that works. It can't be as bad as what we had under communism. In 2011, as we look towards revolutionary movements around the world, it's really hard to know who you want to exemplify. It's very, very hard to make the case that following uh, representative democracy and largely unregulated capitalism is a good way to go, because it's not working out real well for most of North America and most of Western Europe at this point. And so in some ways, what we may actually be facing is a year that's much less predictable than some of these ongoing revolutions. So given that, I, I'm going to throw in a total cop-out I have no hope of telling you where Egypt is going. I have no hope of telling you where Occupy is going. And if you came for that, it's a good thing you got the Oud music, because I'm not going to be able to help you out on that. Where I am going to try to help you out is on a smaller, but still absolutely massive question, which is to say, as we look at all that's taken place in 2011, has social media had something to do with this? Now, this is a much smaller question of, of whether or not we're going to have successful revolutions, but it actually turns out to be a fairly complicated and subtle question as well. You guys may remember at the time that the protests in Tahrir 
succeeded in ousting Mubarak, there was an image that got a, a great deal of play around the world, which was an, an older man, maybe in his, his 40s or 50s, standing in Tahrir Square, huge smile on his face, holding up a cardboard sign that in Arabic says, thank you, and then has the logo for Facebook. And the question that I really want to ask and, and sort of look at tonight is whether that guy was completely deluded or whether there's something to this notion that social media is somehow making protests more common, more effective, more widespread, more, to use an awful word, viral. If, if 2011 really ends up being this sort of year of revolution, is it possible that, that, that social media has something to do with it? So let me talk about sort of two answers that I've heard posed to this question. And the first comes from brilliant author, good Canadian, Malcolm Gladwell, who's totally wrong on this one, but let's hear him out for a moment before we utterly dismiss him. And, and Gladwell has sort of stood up and said, it, it's not the media. What he's basically argued in an essay in The New Yorker and sort of subsequent to that is that protest is one of the, the, the most risky things you can do. Putting yourself out there, putting yourself in physical space, risking arrest, risking violence and physical harm, which, by the way, is, is, is real when we look at what happened in, in Tahrir earlier today. This is not the sort of thing you do for your internet friends. This is the sort of thing you do for the people who are nearest and dearest to you, to your very strong ties. And the only reason you would go out there and risk your skin to potentially put your life on the line is if the people that you care about most in your life are also going out there and doing this. So it can't be the digital media because everybody knows that the relationships we have online are superficial. They're not the most important relationships to us. The relationships we have online are really ones where we're sort of wasting our time, we're playing around. Gladwell leans on a Belarusian thinker, a guy named Evgeny Morozov, who has posited this theory of slacktivism. And in slacktivism, you think you're doing activism, but what you're really doing is putting a bumper sticker on your Facebook page. You're saying I care about something, you're saying I care about it in the digital space, but you're not actually taking any action that leads to anything. So, so what's wrong with this? Well, the first thing that's wrong with this is it's a very naive and old-fashioned view of the internet. It's the sort of view of the internet of someone who's come fairly late to it. For many people who grew up with the internet, some of their strongest ties are the ties on the internet and the people that they're most likely to sort of share common values with and talk about deep ideas with may be people that they're seeing online. And it also turns out that maybe it isn't the strongest ties that are the ones that pull you out into the street. What's so remarkable about Tahrir the first time round is that it brought together segments of Egyptian society that you often don't see together. You had very religious folks with uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood, you had Salafists, you had extremely liberal folks, you had communists, you had students coming together in ways that are all about weak ties and are all about those sorts of loose connections and all about what can happen when you have a common enemy and a common goal associated with it. And the biggest thing that we know is wrong about this is that we've talked to activists and we've basically said, did the internet matter? And they said, yes, it mattered enormously. It helped us figure out how to get our message out. It helped us figure out how to mobilize people. It helped us figure out how to document the movement. And that's why they're standing and holding the sign. It really wasn't paid ad placement from Facebook. So if we look at that and we take it seriously, it seems like we're heading towards another theory. And this other theory is the theory that the internet somehow changes everything. And that as soon as we have access to the internet, as soon as we have the possibility of dialing up a revolution by calling up all of our Facebook friends, we can do things very, very differently. This is an idea that Clay Shirky puts forward in a book called Here Comes Everybody. And this book is basically a way of looking at the idea of internet and group formation. Shirky says the internet makes group formation ridiculously easy. And his idea behind this is that if you have a problem, this problem could be as minor as someone stole my cell phone. You can get a group of people together and you can get them mobilized that idea, behind that idea and they can work with you to solve the problem. And in this sense, he's leaning on a thinker named Howard Rheingold. Howard Rheingold watches something fairly extraordinary take place. He watches the ouster of the Estrada government in the Philippines in 2001. And the way the Estrada government loses power 
is that as accusations come in about corruption, as accusations come in about fixing gambling games, many Filipinos send around a text message saying, come to EDSA, EDSA's a, a, a popular square within Manila, come to EDSA, we're black. And this message goes around, it spreads around, you have tens of thousands of people coming into the streets, and the government falls, basically. You lose the confidence in the presidency, the president steps down, the vice president comes into power. It's amazing what you can do if you only have a mobile phone, if you only have Facebook, and you can mobilize a ton of people. It's an interesting theory. It actually doesn't help us very much with Tahrir, because those protests start taking place on police day. And of course, it's good to remember that the Tahrir protests start with protests against police brutality, but they're scheduled for January 5th for police day. And evidently, the Egyptian government has read their Howard Rheingold as well, because as these protests start to take off, the Egyptian government starts shutting down systems that could be used to mobilize a lot of people. They shut down the internet, they shut down mobile phones, they shut down SMS messaging, and what happens? The protests keep growing. It's possible that this smart mob theory holds early on. It's questionable, but it's possible. It certainly doesn't hold by the time that you shut down all the mobile phone networks and the internet, you simply can't mobilize people anymore. In fact, in talking to Egyptian activists who end up going out into the streets in Tahrir, a number of them said to me, you know, I was watching it on the net, I was watching Al Jazeera stream it, I was tweeting about it, I was blogging about it, then Mubarak shut down my internet and I couldn't watch anymore and I actually had to go in the street to see what was going on. It's actually possible that that shutdown of media and communication systems would actually mobilize people into the streets. So it's clear that that can't be a complete explanation for what goes on there. And we've got to look beyond that and we have to say, it's not that social media is irrelevant, it's not that it's responsible for the entire explanation of how people get together and protest. There's something more complicated that comes to mind. So let's try something different. I want to go back prior to Egypt. I want to study protest in the same way that we might study epidemiology. And that means we should look for patient zero. We should look for the first outbreak of the disease as it spreads throughout the Arab world which means we have to start in Tunisia. And our guide for Tunisia is a very dear friend of mine. His name is Sami Ben Garbia. Sami's now maybe in his early 40s. He's been an activist for a very good chunk of his life uh, and spent most of his 20s fighting against the Ben Ali regime in Tunisia. And Ben Ali is one of the most PR savvy dictators we've ever had. This is a guy who was so slick that despite the fact that his government is one of the most aggressive censors of the internet in the world, that they block an enormous amount of content, his government still was honored with hosting the World Summit on the Information Society, a giant UN-backed gathering of everyone in, in the world to talk about the internet in 2005. This guy has it down. You know, we're not talking long Qaddafi esque speeches, we're talking really slick, you know, dictatorship with an iPod finish on top of it. And so Tunisian activists have had to be really wily, really sharp, really media savvy, and, and really brave. And by the time Sami was about 30, it became clear that he was going to end up in a secret prison. He might never see his family again. He looked around and he said, I have to get out of this country. I'm going to go somewhere less repressive. And he moved to Iran, which gives you a sense for what he thought he was facing at that point in Tunisia. After about a year in Iran, he figured out that that wasn't the right move. He moved to the Netherlands, but he's an amazingly sort of savvy media activist in all of this. And, and here's the narrative that he explains um, Tunisia and explains the Tunisian revolution. So you guys remember that the way that Tunisia starts out is with a young man, Mohamed Blazizi, lighting himself on fire. He immolates because his vegetable cart has been stolen. And because the policewoman who takes his vegetable cart, probably demanding a bribe, humiliates him. And he feels at that point like there's nothing he can do. There's no hope for him within Tunisian society. So he writes a suicide note to his mother. He lights himself on fire. The next day, his mother and some of his family protest 
on the steps of City Hall of a, a really small town, Sidi Bouzid. Sidi Bouzid's a town of about 30,000. <clears> it's in southern Tunisia. You would never go there for any conceivable reason. Most Tunisians don't go there for any conceivable reason. But somehow this protest starts on December 18th on this little cut-off, isolated town. And somehow, over the course of three, three and a half weeks, it spreads throughout the country. So that by the time we get to January 13, Ben Ali is begging for his political life, and when that doesn't work, the next day he gets in an airplane, he goes to Saudi Arabia, you have the fall of a government that had been in place for decades. What's so crazy about this is that Bouazizi is not the first guy to light himself on fire, tragically. He's not even the first vegetable seller to light himself on fire. He's not even the first vegetable seller to light himself on fire in 2010. There's a whole script for how the Tunisian government stops protest. Two years earlier, there's a massive protest in a significantly larger town, a town called Gafsa. It's just up the road from Sidi Pusid. It's a mining town. And the protest in Gafsa has a very clear purpose. The mining exam is your life if you live in Gafsa. If you don't pass the mining exam, you're not getting a job in the mines. If you don't get a job in the mines, you're going to end up selling vegetables. And when the mining exam is rigged, and when the people who don't have the connections and don't have the money don't pass the mining exam, they get very, very upset, and they protest. And the Tunisian government does what it does. It puts a military cordon around the town, prevents any press from getting in and out, international or domestic. International press rarely access Tunisia, but it makes it wholly impossible for anyone to get in there. They fire live ammo at protesters. Usually takes three or four days. They get the message. They go back into their houses. And that protest movement dies. So two years later, similar protest. Harder issue, actually, to get people psyched about. It's about one man and economic frustration. It's not about a rigged election. It's not about a, a rigged exam. Somehow, this ends up turning into an international story and to a national movement. Here's what happens. When his family starts protesting on the steps of City Hall, they pull out mobile phones and they start documenting the protests. And they post it on Facebook. And, and that is key, but probably not in the way you think it is. What you're expecting me to say next is, and then it goes viral. Let me explain to you, when you ever hear a social media expert say, and then it goes viral, what that actually means is, I don't know what happens next. In this case, we, we actually do know what happens next. It goes up on Facebook, and while there are a lot of Tunisians on Facebook, about 17% of the nation at that point, there are not a lot of Facebook people signing up for the We Are All Mohammed Bouazizi group. And the reason for this is that Tunisians aren't dumb. They know that Facebook is monitored. They know that the government has been systematically cracking their passwords to Facebook. They've been phishing for them. So no one is signing up to say, hey, tell me more about Sidi Bouazid. The people who are paying attention to what's being posted on Facebook are Tunisians in the diaspora. They're running websites like a website called Nawat. And Nawat is basically aggregating and curating what's coming out of the social media. It's going into Facebook, it's grabbing these videos, it's putting them together on a timeline, it's translating them. In the media world, we would say it's packaging them. And it's packaging them because it's hoping that someone is going to pick up the story. And someone does. The someone who does is Al Jazeera. And the way to understand that is that Al Jazeera has long wanted to report in Tunisia. They haven't been allowed to work in the country. And they have an enormous chip on their shoulders about being sent out of that country and never being able to open an operation. They also have a very interesting guy on their staff. His name is Mohamed Nanabe. He's in his early 30s. He's a South African, now lives in Doha. And he's the head of new media for Al Jazeera. And for most companies, new media means we're going to push our content out to you via new media. We've produced it, we've put it all together, and now it's time to put up a tweet about it. That's not how Al Jazeera does new media. Al Jazeera uses new media both as an input and an output. 
So you have material, it's being shot on a mobile phone, it's being posted to Facebook, it's getting edited and curated by these folks at Nawat, it's going out to Al Jazeera, and at that point, it becomes visible to other people in Tunisia. They're not able to directly access what's going on in Sidi Bouzid. They're not able to read it in a local newspaper. They're not, for the most part, encountering it online. They're encountering it through old media. They're getting it through broadcast. And we start pulling this apart, what we start realizing is that thinking about social media by itself, simply as a way to get information out there, is probably inadequate. What we have to do is start thinking about an ecosystem. We have to start thinking about this idea that what participatory media does is makes it possible for people to create media at very, very low cost. And then if they're able to use that sort of complicated network, it's possible sometimes, and not always, to get that media out and get it amplified to the point where it reaches enough people that you're able to have a coordinating function, where people in a nation like Tunisia are able to say, wow, we've never seen this before. We've seen people stand up before, and we've seen these movements rise and fall and go away within two or three days. But the fact that people are still protesting after a week, and the fact that it's spreading from one town to another, that's unprecedented. And this is something that I want to be a part of. And that's how it moves from involving a small number of people in a small town to being capable of taking down a government. So if that story is true, I believe it is, it's worth taking a close look at, but it's, it's to me one of the more plausible ways of explaining otherwise what is a really tough mystery, which is how this protest leaves a small town and affects the whole world. We gotta ask the question, is there something special about Facebook? And my answer to that is yes and no. I, first of all, I would say Facebook is not, in fact, my preferred tool for overthrowing governments. It's not secret enough to actually sort of protect your clandestine communications. It, it, it's actually fairly bad about letting you publish to a global audience because it's trying to publish to a small, semi-private group of people. But, but it is special in a, in a very particular way. The way in which Facebook is special is that Facebook understands how Web 2.0 works well. It understands the basic rules of how the internet is wired. So Web 1.0, right, the original web that came out, Tim Berners-Lee, early 1990s, comes out of CERN. It's invented for a very specific audience and a very specific purpose. It's designed to help physicists share research papers. We reinvent the internet in the late 1990s. That whole dot-com boom, sort of as that dot-com boom is falling apart, the dust is settling, the internet gets reinvented. And it gets reinvented around a different paradigm, it's got a different audience, it has a different purpose. The purpose of Web 2.0 is to share cute pictures of kitty cats. And, 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 and I say that, and you think I'm joking, but it's not. It's, it's not epiphenomenal that the cat flushing the toilet goes out on YouTube and everyone pays attention to it, that's what we built it for. And, and I do quite literally mean we. I was one of the people involved with this. And in the mid-1990s, we were looking at the internet and we were saying, we've got this interesting business, Tripod, we're gonna provide carefully edited content for young students who are coming out of college, we're gonna tell you how to get your first job and your first mutual fund and how to get an apartment. And by the way, we have some, some cute technical tricks as well. If you wanna put up your own customized resume and a simple homepage, we'll let you do that as well. And we put up these tools and we look back a couple of months later and suddenly those homepages, those incredibly simple, often ghastly, ugly homepages, are getting anywhere between 100 and 500 times as much traffic as the content that I am paying Harvard graduates to carefully craft so that people can figure out what are correct tools for life. And the content that's really winning is really dumb content. It's pages of cute pictures of kittens. And it took us 18 months to figure this out, that the kittens were beating the content. And that at a certain point, the kittens were the content. And that's what people wanted. People wanted the ability to create content about what they cared about, not what I cared about, not what my editors cared about, but what they cared about and find a way to, to share it. 
Now, you can read this one of two ways. If you're an aspiring writer, this is a really, really crushing discovery. But if you're interested in democratic movements, actually, this is pretty interesting. This notion that anyone can use a very, very simple tool and create content that other people can pay attention to has some very interesting implications. So in 1996, I, I'm still trying to figure this problem out. I'm trying to figure out what are people actually using our service to do? Why is it useful? And I look at where my users are coming from. Most of my users are from the US. Second most popular country is the UK. The fourth most popular is Canada. The third most popular is Malaysia. Why do I have users from Malaysia? I have an English language website designed to help people figure out life after college. Where are these Malaysians coming from? I print out a whole bunch of home pages in Malay. I walk to the university that's in the little town where I'm working on this. I knock on the door of the political science department. I say, is anyone here a Southeast Asia specialist? I find the Southeast Asia specialist. I hand over a sheaf of papers and I say, what's going on? The learned professor looks over and reads it, hands it back to me and says, you're hosting the opposition movement in Malaysia. You're hosting Reformasi. In 1996, in Malaysia, there's this guy, Anwar Ibrahim. He had been the vice president. He's hounded out of the office with false accusations of sodomy because he has a vision for an extremely liberal version of an Islamic state. It's a vision where an Islamic state is held in check by a constitution. It's actually quite an inspiring vision. And he's being systematically harassed by the government that's in power, which controls many of the other media outlets. And this is the one tool that people associated with Reformasi have as a way of coordinating their actions and publishing. And as a result, we have tens of thousands of Malaysians. The same tools that are helping other people share cute photos of cats are helping these people find a way to have a digital public sphere. Not the sort of space that they could have in the real world. It would have been far too dangerous to try to organize around this. But online, there was a capability to carve out a space for free speech. So I've been trying to make this argument for a while. I talk to a lot of folks who are digital activists I talk to a lot of smart programmers who are trying to build tools, and they're trying to help people like Occupy, and they're trying to help the people who are in Tahrir, or who are fighting oppression in different places. And what they all focus on is making tools that are bulletproof, top secret, extremely high tech, extremely sensitive. If you want to have perfectly encrypted communication between all the people in your network, that's what they're working on. And I do not need to mean to diss these tools. They're incredibly important. And some of the tools out there, like Tor, are just utterly essential for having meaningful anonymity on the internet. But I worry that we don't take these cute cat tools seriously enough. These tools that anybody can use, that are used 99% of the time for completely banal purposes, purposes that you and I may find incredibly boring, unless it's the exact interest we care about, in which case they're very interesting. And there's some reasons why these cute cat tools are so powerful. Let me just say, when we're talking about cute cat tools, I'm talking about things like YouTube, I'm talking about Flickr, I'm talking about Facebook, I'm talking about Twitter, I'm talking about any of these tools that allow people to create and share original content that have many millions of users. And that many millions of users turns out to be key. If you're building a tool for people to share cute cat pictures rather than physics papers, you're building a much simpler tool. Web 1.0 was not very easy to use. If the assumption was you were a physicist to use it, generally speaking, we tried to make the tools pretty complicated because physicists are pretty complicated people. But when the assumption is that you just want to get cute cat pictures, you spend a lot of time thinking about how to make these tools very usable. And what it means is that these tools end up being very usable even if you don't speak the language, even if you were not the originally intended audience for them, you will often find a way to use them. And because these tools are used by hundreds of millions of people, there's a good chance that when someone decides to engage in an act of activism, that these are the tools that they are already using and will therefore use. Because this is the truth. Most of us are not, in fact, professional activists. Something happens in our life that we get upset about or we get passionate about, and we reach for the tools that we are already using 
And we use those tools to try to share our concerns with the people who we want to reach. I watched friends of mine in Kenya in 2007. Kenya had an election in 2007 that went horrifically, horrifically bad, turned into terrible ethnic violence. And the people who ended up really sharing what was going on with Kenya and the world were bloggers. And for the most part, they weren't political bloggers. They were people who normally wrote about things like rugby. And so you would have a blog from my friend Dowdy Were, which was mostly about Sevens Rugby, which was a sport that I had barely known existed, that suddenly became this cutting-edge site for photojournalism for what was going on in the streets of Nairobi. All those millions of people using tools to talk about their interests, no matter what those interests are, that is a latent capacity. That's a group of people capable of creating media, and that media can become very political if it needs to be. Now, there's at least two other reasons why these cute cat tools matter. We know that many governments of the world, far too many, about four dozen at this point, engage in some sort of censorship of the internet. They block, on a state level, major websites and make it very, very difficult. Not impossible, but very difficult to get to those websites. Now, certain websites are almost invariably blocked. My friends at humanrightswatch.org probably lead the league tables. They're probably blocked by, by almost everybody who chooses to censor the internet at this point. The problem with blocking Human Rights Watch is that the only people who notice are the sorts of people who look at Human Rights Watch. And I hate to break it to those of you who are Human Rights Watch members, I am. We are a very, very small minority in most countries. Most people are not, in fact, generally attuned to issues of human rights. And so when you block a site like Human Rights Watch, you're alerting that very small set of people that your government is engaging in acts of censorship. What happens when a video of police brutality makes it onto YouTube? Governments get really paranoid. They start pressuring YouTube. If they can't get YouTube to take it down, eventually they block YouTube. What happens when you block YouTube? A lot more people notice. And it's not because they went to YouTube to see that video of police brutality. They went to see the cat flushing the toilet. But if you can't see the cat flushing the toilet, you then ask the question. And you say, why can't I see the cat flushing the toilet? I want to see the cat flushing the toilet. It's really cute. Let me see it. And you start talking to your friends and you find out that your government is censoring this because you have a problem with police brutality. You block Facebook, you block YouTube, people notice. And what you're really looking for as activists are for people to notice the issues you care about. And so by using those platforms, you give yourself a chance to have the government fight back against you and actually have that work for your cause and open it up to a much wider range of people. Lately, it's become even more important because the, the thing that people do nowadays to stop speech on the internet that they don't like is a technique called DDoS, Distributed Denial of Service. And while actually explaining DDoS gets fairly technical, we can think of it this way. If you guys don't like what I'm saying here, and if one of you stands up and starts heckling me, it's probably not going to stop me from talking. I'll probably be able to talk over you, I'm amplified, I'm really loud, I have a very thick skin. But if all of you stand up and start heckling me, it gets very, very hard for me to continue giving a speech at this point. That's what happens with DDoS. You have a computer hitting a website and sort of reloading it over and over and over and over and over again. And if I do that just on my machine to a website I don't like and just do it over and over and over again, it's annoying, but it's not a real problem. If we all get together and do it, it's a real problem. And in fact, DDoS is so powerful that it's often able to take down fairly major websites. Most DDoS attacks, most denial of service attacks, don't actually ask us all to get together and hit reload, although that is, by the way, what these guys with Anonymous are doing. Uh, all these attacks that you've seen coming out from the Hacker Collective are, are basically voluntary DDoS. What's much more powerful are actually people who are going out there and hiring botnets, networks of compromised computers, computers that have been attacked with viruses and harnessed together so they can basically hit the website over and over and over again. And these are so powerful in some cases that they don't just silence the website that they were trying to silence. 
I've been working with a group called Irrawaddy. They publish probably the most influential Burmese dissident journal. They're dissident Burmese. They're critiquing the government. It's published out of Thailand. The first time they got hit with a DDoS, it knocked Thailand off the internet. So they had to leave Thailand, and then they moved to Sweden, and the next one almost knocked Sweden off the internet. They're now based on US internet. But these attacks are really massive and really powerful. And for human rights organizations, independent media organizations that are trying to withstand onslaughts like this, you are a whole lot better having your page on something like a YouTube or a blogger than having it on your own website where someone can go and attack it because suddenly it becomes Google's problem or Yahoo's problem or someone's problem, someone with many, 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 many more technical people than you have to figure out how to defend your site. So there's two problems with this. You know, I've been going around, I've been basically saying to human rights organizations, look, if you feel like you're in danger, if you feel like you're gonna have a hard time organizing online, think about using these cute cat tools. Think about using these shared platforms. It can give you much better reach. It gives you all sorts of positive side effects. You have a much better chance of being out there. There's two problems with this theory. The first problem with this theory is China. And China is a big, big, big problem. And China is a big problem in part because China is now a very big part of the global internet. We're talking about 480 million internet users in China. And the Chinese internet is incredibly complicated. Most of us have heard about the Great Firewall. The Great Firewall is a set of filters that make it difficult to access certain websites. They also make it difficult to access certain types of content, certain words. But the Great Firewall is really only the tip of the iceberg. The part of the Chinese internet that makes it very, very difficult to do what we're talking about is a problem called intermediary censorship. And here's how it works. China makes it really hard for you to go and access a website like YouTube. But it's really easy for you to access a website like Youku, which, by the way, has cute cats, has cute cat videos. It, in fact, has cats flushing Chinese toilets. The cats speak Mandarin and Cantonese. If, if you are a Chinese person looking for cute cats, you are much better on Youku than you are on YouTube. And Youku has an internal terms of service that requires them to block certain types of content. And that content blocking can be automatic. My very dear friend Rebecca McKinnon, internet and China scholar, went onto the Chinese internet, tried to create a blog, and the title was, I Love Freedom of Speech, Human Rights, and Democracy. <laughs> and she enters this into a Chinese blogging platform, she gets a wonderful message back, and she enters it in Chinese, not in English. Enters it in Chinese, gets a wonderful message back. The message is, you must enter a title for your space. The title must not contain prohibited language, such as profanity. Please type a different title. So one of those words in there, probably human rights, probably democracy, is triggering some sort of internal filter within that tool. That platform, that content hosting platform, will not let you post that content. So how do you react to this? Well, one of the ways you react to this is humor, right? Humor turns out to be an incredibly valuable weapon against autocracies. And humor comes into the Chinese internet all the time. And the way that it comes in in this case is that for a while as Chinese bloggers, you were used to having your blog censored. And so your blog would be censored and you'd write a message saying, geez, my blog just got censored. And so then the word censored became a trigger. You couldn't post the message saying my blog got censored. And so instead you started saying my blog got harmonized. And the reason for this was the actual censorship message said, in the interests of societal harmony, we have removed the following content. And so everyone started talking about, damn, my blog got harmonized. And then harmonized became a bad word. You couldn't say your blog got harmonized, but it turns out that the word in Mandarin, and, and I can't speak Mandarin, but it's, it's hey, she, is very, very close to the word for river crab. And so you started saying, my blog got river crabbed. Now, this is very funny in that you start seeing you know, animated cartoons of river crabs. And in fact, if you start paying attention to freedom of speech on the Chinese internet, you see river crabs and you see on the other side the grass mud horse, uh, which is 
transliterated and incredibly rude Chinese insult. Uh, but you could write it as grass mud horse and not have it be offensive, whereas the other way to do it is very, very offensive, which is usually portrayed as a llama. And so if you spend any time on the Chinese internet, you see llamas fighting these swarms of crabs. And if you know what they're talking about, it turns out to be very interesting commentary on the forces of freedom of speech. The problem, though, is that you're speaking in code. And you're speaking only to the people who are in the know. You're speaking only to the people who know it. There's another weapon that's starting to come into play that actually looks like it's much more powerful, and that is speed. The internet, particularly the participatory internet, is speeding up. It's getting really, really fast. And the biggest thing in China right now is a service called Sina Weibo. And Sina Weibo is a little bit like Twitter, but it's Twitter on steroids. It's actually significantly better than Twitter in a bunch of different ways. It supports images, it supports comments, you can do threading. It's actually pretty kick-ass, and it's sort of embarrassing a little bit that we haven't caught up to it. And, and it's proving really hard to censor Weibo. So in July, there was a high-speed train crash. The news about this was, in fact, very, very sensitive. But it made it out on Weibo, and it made it quite far before anyone was able to figure out how to say, hey, you've got to censor this. The censors often have a six or 12 or 24 hour catch up time. And so it's possible that the real solution is to simply figure out how to take advantage of that very limited window of free speech that's open. Because if these tools thrive on speed, if they thrive on getting information out there and having people react very quickly, if you slow them down, you break them. And it would be really, really hard to ban Sina Weibo at this point because you have hundreds of millions of people using it for the most cute cats of reasons. Most of them are not necessarily looking for the high-speed train. Most of them are not sharing river crabs. They're looking at celebrities. They're telling jokes. But that tool has the latent capacity to be used for that sort of reporting. So look, I want to make an argument that it's not just the governments that we have to worry about. In China, the government is probably the scariest thing that we have to worry about. In Egypt, we've seen very little actual censorship of the internet, but we've seen so much threat of people who've used the internet and so much willingness to use violence that it has an implicit threat about people using the internet. But I want to start making the case that we need to think beyond even terrifying legislation like what's going on in the US right now with the Stop Online Piracy Act, which basically gives copyright holders the ability to arbitrarily shut down sites on essentially an allegation that they might be infringing, uh, contributing to piracy and sharing infringing materials. I want to actually suggest that we think about another control of speech, which is the corporate role in all of this. So we've been watching Occupy Wall Street. It's a set of protests that have been unfolding in Zuccotti Park in New York. The history of Zuccotti Park is sort of a weird thing. Most people don't know who Zuccotti is. Zuccotti, as it turns out, is a New York City property developer. He gets a park named after him because he makes available a piece of land that he owns near Wall Street. He makes it available as a privately owned public space. And he does this not out of the generosity of his heart. He does this because it's an exchange for being to build some taller buildings in the area. But this privately owned public space is the closest park to Wall Street. And it's the park that protesters picked as the place to hold the Occupy Wall Street demonstrations. Now, the trick about these privately owned public spaces is that they've got usage agreements. You implicitly agree to use that park in certain ways when you walk into it. And those usage agreements can change at any time. And in fact, after Zuccotti Park got occupied, the usage agreement changed about three weeks afterwards to say, you can't sleep on the ground, you can't have a tent, you can't sleep on the benches. And after changing the terms of service for Zuccotti Park, the owners of Zuccotti Park went to the NYPD and said, you need to enforce this. You need to help us figure out how do we clean out our park. And what we saw earlier this week was Zuccotti Park get disassembled. Protesters were forced out in the middle of the night. The park was cleaned. There's now a cordon and a barricade around the park. You can get into the park. You can even protest in the park. You can occupy the park, but you can't sleep in the park. Because now that terms of service for Zuccotti Park is being 
enforced by the NYPD. Now, this is going to seem like an overblown analogy, but I actually think it's fairly helpful. We are engaged with the internet in a set of privately owned public spaces. When we try to use a tool like Facebook or Twitter or YouTube for political purposes, we are taking advantage of the fact that there are private companies making available to us this digital public sphere. And for the most part, I actually think these companies are pretty excited about offering this digital public sphere. And many of them have the same reaction that I had at Tripod when I suddenly discovered that the Malaysians were using this space. But not everyone is as excited about it at all at the same time. And if you want a sense for how dangerous this can be, remember what happened to WikiLeaks earlier this year. WikiLeaks had released large collections of documents, and they were starting to be attacked by large sustained denial of service attacks. And these were knocking them off their servers in Europe. And so the organizers behind WikiLeaks said, we know what to do. We're going to follow cute cat theory. We're going to move over to Amazon. We're going to take advantage of the fact that Amazon makes it possible to rent servers. They're giant, giant, giant servers because so many people depend on Amazon for a back end. So we're going to move over there and we're going to be immune to DDoS attacks. And Amazon, about halfway through this process, said, wait a second. We are not providing services to you. We think you may be violating US law, and you're just not going to use our services. Sorry, gone. There's all sorts of legal rationale behind it. We can go into sort of the details on it. But actually, Amazon, in this case, uh, takes the step that a number of people did. A number of people who provided services to WikiLeaks, including their DNS providers, said, I'm sorry, we're having nothing to do with you. And WikiLeaks continues to suffer from the fact that there are providers out there that are essentially saying, we're not going to support the financial side of what you do. Those organizations end up acting as censors. And they have an incredible amount of control over speech. And I have to tell you, this is a really hard problem to get around in technical terms. Because the truth is, if you want to reach a whole lot of people and you're being attacked and shut down, there's very little out there that you can do. Eben Moglen is working on this very interesting idea called the Freedom Box, where you can put a little server, a little standalone server, and you can put up your website, and it by itself is not very powerful, but if a lot of people have a lot of Freedom Boxes, you can share your website with them as well. They can jointly serve it. We don't need corporations. Kumbaya, we'll all find a way to have a free and independent internet by ourselves, except for the little problem that the line that you put into the back of the box to connect it to the public internet is also from a private company. It's corporations all the way down. For better or for worse, we have built an internet, this incredibly powerful space for speech, but we've built it on private companies. And what's interesting is that these private companies now have a fantastic challenge to try to figure out. Well before we are all Khaled Saeed, the, the, the Facebook page that was so important in mobilizing people to Tahrir, there was a guy named Wael Abbas. And Wael Abbas is an Egyptian human rights activist. He's been putting up videos of police brutality since about 2005. And in 2000, he moved from his own site, which was getting DDoSed all the time. He moved over to YouTube, put his videos up on YouTube. And in 2007, YouTube shut down his account. And they shut down his account for a very straightforward reason. He was posting phenomenally violent, brutal videos. And people complained about the content of the videos, and they shut down his account. To their great credit, the CEO, uh, the, the general counsel of Google, and the people behind YouTube looked at this and said, that, that doesn't feel right. We really want to be able to figure out how we accommodate that content. So they put together an alternative process, and they basically said, if there's something that violates our terms of service, but it has importance for human rights, we're going to have a separate process to figure out how we deal with it. And they built this process. They put Wael Abbas back up there. And what I've now noticed is that when people start posting politically sensitive video to YouTube, it tends to stay up. I got video from friends in Bahrain as they were starting to protest and pro-roundabout. I got sent this horrific video of unarmed protesters being shot. And it was sent to me by a Bahraini friend who said, look, I'm going to put this up on YouTube. I know they're going to take it down. Will you please archive it for me? We'll find another way to get it up. And so I duly archived it. It's on my hard drive. 
And then I went to YouTube, and I was thrilled because I looked for it on YouTube, and I got a page saying, warning, this is an extremely graphic video, but it's also really important. And so we're going to put it up there. We're going to warn you so that you don't stumble on it. You don't accidentally find yourself looking at something that you don't want to look at, but we're going to ensure that this is a space that we can use for human rights dialogue. Now, some companies are faster than others on this. That, that we are Khaled Saeed page, the page that's so important within Tahrir, got taken down at least six times by Facebook. It got taken down because people would complain about it and they would say, this is a dangerous page. And Facebook would look at it and say, hey, it's in Arabic. We don't speak Arabic. And they'd take it down because their process essentially said, if five people complain about a page, maybe it's 10, maybe it's five, maybe it's two, we should take it down. And then later it got taken down because Facebook has a very strict policy about real names. And the person who was administering that page, it turned out a Google executive in Egypt who didn't want to use his name, was using a pseudonym. And so when they found out that it was a pseudonym, it had to come down. They finally found a compromise where they found an Egyptian living in Canada who was willing to administer that page under her own name. That was the only way that that page remained up. So it can take a while. It can be extremely difficult. We need to think through this. We need to think through this idea. If digital space is an important space for organizing in real life, if it's important for documenting our movements, if it's important for figuring out how to mobilize people, we need to find a way to treat it both as a public space and as a private space. And there's at least two approaches to this. I'm spending a lot of my time going and talking to the people that I used to work with. I'm looking for audience of people who are overweight, long-haired, and speak Unix as a first language, and I'm saying to them, I know that you work for a company, I know that you have shareholders, I know that you have a bottom line. I also know that you're passionate about the internet working correctly, and that you like fighting certain things like spam or phishing because it's just wrong, it breaks the internet. And I'm asking you to do one step further, I'm asking you to ensure the survival of the network public sphere. Even if it's easier for you to shut down certain types of speech, I'm asking you not to do it because it could be really important for someone in Egypt or someone in Tunisia or someone in a part of the world that you've never even heard of. But there's another approach to this, and this is the approach that my dear friend Rebecca McKinnon is taking. She has a new book coming out right now. It's called Consent of the Networked. And what she says is, look, these companies, much as we love them, and we do love them in many cases, are basically benevolent dictators. They have an enormous amount of power about what we do online, and at the moment in our relation to them, we have signed away our rights through a contract of adhesion that we've agreed to without actually reading by clicking on a terms of service. And it's time for us to have our Magna Carta movement. We're not necessarily asking to run Facebook, or to run YouTube, but we are asking for a writ of habeas corpus. If you're gonna find a way to take down our content, there needs to be a reason for it. There needs to be a process. There needs to be a way that, that we can be involved with this. And so she's asking people to sort of stand up and think of themselves as netizens. Think of themselves as emerging as citizens of these different spaces. And I think we need to think of ourselves as citizens in a bunch of different ways. We need to think of ourselves as citizens of states that respect this idea of a network public sphere. We need to think of ourselves as empowered users and netizens of the companies that we rely on to run these spaces. If, we, if, if you guys share my sense that the internet is an utterly critical resource for a democracy, to have open governance in the 21st century, to have the ability of social movement. This is a really good time to tell our governments and to tell our corporations that we want our cute cats and that we want our rights too. Thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning, we have time for maybe 10 minutes of questions. Uh, the basic rule in the questions is if you can keep them short, please, uh, because I'd like to try to get as many questions as possible into the 10 minutes. The uh, two microphones are on either side, and it looks like there's somebody approaching the microphone right now, sir. 
Hello? Okay. Um, I was thinking about, you were talking about how the different tools can be very powerful and how like the idea of Web 2.0 is that you want to get people excited about something and get them to use it. How does the idea of using gamification of uh, different things work with like crowdsourcing and can that be a more powerful tool to make human rights work better in, within the Web 2.0 sphere? So um, you're asking two really interesting questions there and, and sort of asking a question of whether we can get more people involved with issues like human rights by sort of adding a game layer to it, which is what most, most people talk about with gamification. You're also asking a question about whether crowdsourcing, which is the practice of getting a whole lot of people to work together on a project, uh, could have strong implications for human rights. Um, I know the answer to the second question is yes, because I look at tools like Ushahidi, uh, which is a Kenyan-made tool designed for group reporting, particularly in crisis situations, and that's been incredibly powerful. That tool was built in the wake of those 2008 elections, and it invited people to basically collectively report on what was going on with houses and shops being burned and looted, and to come up with a very thorough map of what was happening as a result of that. And the people who built that tool made it open source, they made it accessible to a very large number of people. It's now getting used all over the world, and it was used, for instance, in Haiti, in the wake of the earthquakes there, which made it possible for people to document what was going on, whose home wa was in danger, who was still in need of medical care, and actually provide an enormous amount of information um, to the people who are trying to provide care to the Haitian people at that moment. So we know that that works. I'm a bit more suspicious of gamification, and, and I, I take this notion of slacktivism actually fairly seriously. Um, as, as much as I think it's sort of dismissing what a lot of people are doing online, you know, the danger of life online is that we can make things too easy. And that if what we're trying to do is get people to sign online petitions and then we're giving them points for it, the danger is that we're not actually helping people learn more about an issue, sort of get more engaged with it. For me, when I look at how I want to get people engaged with these issues, I think much more about storytelling. Uh, and what I'm really interested in is finding a way to sort of catch somebody's attention, find out something that they're really upset about, like the number of people who were killed by the military government in Egypt today, and then use that as a way to sort of reel people in and sort of get the fuller story. So for me, I, I don't know that a game helps us. I do know that stories help us, but I think it, it's potentially a very powerful technology. Other questions? Yay, more questions. Um, I just had a question about what you spoke to about how the public, or sorry, the internet, for better or for worse, is largely a privately controlled thing. It is something that came out of the public sector, and now um, you, you spoke to how problematic it is that some private companies are now censoring things. So I'm wondering, um, should we work within this private paradigm, or is, there a, is it a time for like a public YouTube? So here's what's hard about doing a public YouTube. I might be comfortable with a Canadian public YouTube, but I'm not comfortable with a Syrian public YouTube. And this is the danger of, and maybe I'm not comfortable with a Canadian public YouTube. I, I don't know, it's your government, not mine. Um, it's really hard to create state-funded institutions that have independence. You look at something like the CBC, and to have a national broadcaster that's capable of doing really important critical work, you need to have a great deal of isolation from the money and basically have a, a, a practice which sort of says, yes, the money's going to go in, it's going to make it possible, but it's not going to have control over the content. And a few governments have managed to work it out and a whole lot of governments have managed to screw it up. Um, so I'm suspicious of that model, although I, I do think it's worth talking about. What I've seen people do instead is essentially say, well, can't we just all do it independently? You know, can't we find a way to all do it individually? And when you see something like um, the folks who are trying to build mesh wireless networks, 
The theory behind mesh networks is that if we could manage to get this sort of new technology off the ground, we wouldn't need ISPs anymore, and then we really could do it privately. The problem is they're really hard to build. And unless you need them for sort of human rights uses, you're probably a lot more likely to use sort of existing internet service providers of one fashion or another. So I, I am what you might call sort of a radical realist. Um, I, I, I'm happy to sort of acknowledge the idealistic side of it, but I, I always sort of insist on finding the solution to the problem that's sort of on the table at the moment. And the solution to the problem that's on the table at the moment is to help companies figure out how to do the right thing and help them understand that their users are going to punish them if they don't do the right thing. And that, that may be naming and shaming, that may be, I hope, praising and celebrating when they do it right, but inviting the companies to get it right and to explicitly say, we want our tool to be useful to you as a tool for political speech and for protest, and we're going to find a way to do that. And that doesn't mean everything goes, and that doesn't mean that suddenly child pornography is, is, is political speech, but we're going to find a way to do this because we understand that it's part of our responsibility as a responsible corporation. Whether or not we end up with a, with a public or a truly decentralized internet in the future, I think that would all be great, but in the short term, this is something that we have to do right now. Uh, two more questions. I'm just wondering what you are aware of in terms of these kind of um, attacks or repressions being used in the U.S. in the last week. Um, in the last week, I was up till 1.30 for about three nights watching live stream and, and watching the Twitter feed on what was going on with Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Dallas and Occupy Seattle. And there were reports that, well, first of all, this one might be a simple answer, but hashtag OWS wouldn't trend. That was one of the things that was kind of going around. And another was um, that the live stream feed was taken down in Dallas or that it was jammed. I'm just wondering if you can comment on those allegations or whatever. So I know that the first allegation about OWS is untrue. Uh, and I know it in part because uh, a really brilliant data scientist named Gilad Lotan has written several thousand words on the topic. Uh, and if you want sort of the definitive answer on it, it's actually worth looking at sort of what he's written about it. It turns out that Twitter trending topics are surprisingly tough to break into. And despite how much enthusiasm there has been from me, for one, you for another, in OWS, many of the times that it's threatened to trend have been at incredibly stupid moments like Kim Kardashian's wedding. And so he's got this sort of 5,000 word detailed data rich blog post sort of showing, you know, when you would expect the sort of Brooklyn Bridge incident to trend, how Kim Kardashian sort of ends up knocking it off. So he, he does Twitter for a living and, and he, he basically works as the head of analytics for a company that studies Twitter professionally and, uh, and I highly recommend his work. It, it turns out that in fact uh, it did trend. Uh, in the middle of the night during the shutdown uh, and trended nationally. It's the first time it's trended internationally on all of it. Um, but there's a really good explanation on, on sort of the backstory and all of that. I, I don't know on the live stream. I, I think it's incredibly unlikely that it's malfeasance. Uh, one of the truths of the internet is that it breaks all the freaking time. And that when it breaks, you know, we sort of assume that it's, it's trying to constrain the political content that's going on. What I would actually say with Occupy is, is, is that I, I'm seeing actually something quite different, which is that I'm fascinated by how well documented Occupy is within participatory media. So that when we have an incident like the utterly absurd incident at UC Davis, where uh, the, the university security forces are pepper spraying seated protesters who are not doing anything to resist in their faces. We have footage of that. And we have footage of that because people with these movements have their mobile phones on and are recording at all time and it's going out on live stream. And the fact that we're getting that information, I think is going to change how police deal with situations like this in the long run. I think there's gonna be a lot of legal cases and a lot of pushback over the next couple of months that are gonna change it in the long run. But I think the moments aside where the media isn't working on behalf of Occupy are actually sort of the exceptions rather than the rule at this point, or at least that's what I understand from having looked pretty closely at the tech behind it. Last question. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, social media in um, 
riots and things that don't have a direct political aim. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to something like how social media acted in um, the Lenin riots or the Vancouver riots, um, and whether you think there's a connection to the internet and how those are starting to be shaped. It's a great question. Um, I haven't mentioned the Vancouver riots uh, in part because I think mentioning that I'm from Boston and a hockey fan is probably not a very good idea in this room. <laughs> Uh, so I, I decided I would just leave out, leave out rioting altogether. Um, it, you know, I think that in the case of London, which I will address because it's less dangerous for me, um, social media got a really bad rap. So, so the, the, the story on the London riots as sort of ends up being told by the media is, you know, they're burning down Tottenham and they're doing it because they're using these secret Blackberry messages and that's what's getting people out to, to go ahead and do it. Are you kidding me? It was the biggest story on British television for 10 days. You could have hidden under a rock and you still would have heard about what was going on. And this is what I sort of mean by the ecosystem side of it. I mean, what was really telling people about the London riots and essentially saying, here's what rioters are doing. They're going out at this time of day and they're going after these types of shops and, you know, you know, bad newspapers, ban the television, you know, they're mobilizing people to riot. I think there's an aspect of moral panic that comes into play when we see something really unexpected. When we see something that we're embarrassed by in our society, we look for the culprit. And one of the very natural culprits is new media. And we look for a way that new media must be responsible for this in ways before. But if you take the ecosystem view, in many cases, old media is at least as effective at sort of getting that message out. What's really interesting to me, both in London and in Vancouver, is the fact that so much digital content was created that it's a form of surveillance. And that, I, I believe, both in Vancouver and in London, that ended up being a tool for arresting some of the people who were involved with this incredibly stupid activity. And, and so in the case of Occupy, right, we have this, this wonderful emergence. We have, this is not my term, by the way, but it's wonderful, of surveillance, um, of, of watching from the bottom up. And so we can watch the watchers because we all get the mobile phones. But in the cases where we're acting like idiots, that same footage ends up being surveillance. And it ends up documenting us acting like idiots and, and allows there to be political consequences for that action. 